WebEx software we are currently using to host, to host tonight's workshop. Lastly, many thanks to all the NOFA mass, staff, and board who have helped to make this workshop possible. And if you're not currently a member of NOFA mass, we really encourage you to become a member. Feel free to go to our website at www.nofamass.org, or you can contact me directly, and I can put you in contact with our membership coordinator. Tonight's presenters are Noah and Sophie corser kellerman owners of Apparella Farm. Tonight's format is going to be a little different. Uh, the viewers and listeners on the phone and viewers on our webinar will be allowed to ask questions as the presentation flows. And so the best way to submit your questions you can use the chat feature, which is towards the top of your computer or at the bottom, and just type a question. As we progress through the presentation, I'll get that to our presenters. If you're on the phone, and we welcome all of our call-in uh, participants, you can reach me at 413-214-1237. Feel free to text me a question for our presenters, and I'll get those questions to you. Um, Lastly, if you do run into any technical issues, you can uh, use the chat feature or you can text me as well and I can assist you with that. So without further ado, I'm going to turn our presentation <coughs> over now to Noah and Sophie corser kellerman And I know they are on the line and ready to go. You're still there, Noah and Sophie? Yes, we are. We're here. We're All here. right. All right. Can you hear us? All right. So now uh, we should be able to see your screen pretty soon. We all set? And you are ready to go. Awesome. Well, welcome everybody. Thanks for taking this January evening to cozy up and plan for next year and hear more about what we do here in Essex. Um, I'm Noah. And I'm is, Sophie. Um, we run Alprilla Farm together in Essex, Mass. Um, and I think I'll just start with uh, describing a little bit about the farm, just sort of some of our history and what we do. Um, we grow about three and a half acres of vegetables each year, most of which is on leased land. We have a CSA share that goes from October to February with 90 shares, um, which is a mix of barter and paying. Um, we go to a farmer's market in the fall and early winter. Um, we also wholesale to a number of restaurants and um, we do a bulk order where people can order medium quantities of vegetables at wholesale prices and pick up on the farm. Um, Another interesting thing that we have going on is we do a lot of our veggie production with ox power. Um, we still have a couple tractors that we use for primary tillage for the most part, and it's nice to have a front end loader but we've been using ox power uh, for all of our cultivation um, and some other tasks around the farm, uh, which has been really fun. There'll be photos of them in a little bit. Um, in our rotation, we, in addition to vegetables, we grow a okay. couple acres of grain each year. Um, primarily wheat, uh, although we've been doing some rye and we've done some barley in the past. Um, this works really well agronomically for us. Uh, it gives us a way to rotate away from annual weeds and pests and disease. And it also allows us to get a good crop of clover growing underneath the grain, as you can see in the lower left corner of the screen, um, that really drives our fertility cycle and helps us keep our soil in good condition. Um, we also grow some dry corn and beans as we're able to fit it into our rotation and to find time for it. 
Um, are you on this? Um, we also, it's worth mentioning, um, most of Alprilla Farm is really low-lying clay land uh, that's not suitable for annual crop production. So we, actually most of our vegetables are on leased land and to keep the home farm being used for food production, uh, a few years ago we got into raising beef. Um, we do 10 or 12 animals a year. We make all of our own hay and we use intensive rotational grazing. So we're moving the animals every one or two days um, all over the farm. Um, we like to think of our farm as a little big farm. Um, where we're using principles that are that were used traditionally in crop rotations up until the advent of chemical fertilizer, where we have grain and sod um, with corn and beans as a row crop part of the rotation. And so we, um, but we've just mixed in the vegetables as the row crop part of the rotation. Um, so we're not really inventing anything new. We've been really influenced by uh, Eric and Ann Nordell, who are produce farmers in Pennsylvania who use horsepower extensively. Um, I think we might have some technical issues. You can't see it? Uh, it's up right now. We've been going through it. Okay, um, what does that symbol look like? <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay, okay, so can you see my screen right now? Okay. Oh no. I'm sorry that you guys have been missing these photos. We'll go through them real quick. Thanks, Anna. Okay. Sorry about that, you guys. So what we've been talking about is the enterprises we have on the farm, um, which is sort of a combination of grains, beef, and winter veggies. These are the photos of the draft power that we've been using. So we have this pair of oxen that we've raised on the farm. Um, these photos are a little bit old. This is when we were converting our beds over. So now our beds are a little tighter and most of them are one row crops on 42 inches. Uh, we can talk more about ox power later if people have interest. Um, this is sort of the landscape that we're working with, really low lying fields. Um, and most of the home farm are using for beef cattle and um, our grain rotation. And let's see where, and then so Noah was just talking about how we're using um, a rotation that's sort of a traditional rotation um, with the fields being fallowed in a sod or grain crop, um, but unlike a traditional rotation, we're using the, the row crop year like you would use for corn as just uh, winter storage vegetables for the most part. I'll give it back to Noah. Great. So, um... You might ask, how did we end up doing a winter CSA as the main part of our business? And we, it's a relatively new enterprise for us. Um, a good friend of mine and I started Alprilla Farm um, in 2011 as we were finishing up with college. And our first season, we did 40 shares uh, for a summer CSA on about an acre. And we did farmer's market and restaurant sales. We're still working with many of the businesses that we started selling to that season. Um, I met Sophie in 2012 and she started farming here in 2013. 
and we haven't really looked back. Um, in 2015, we got a small herd of cattle and through and have had a really steep learning curve, um, but uh, we've stuck with it. In 2016, um, we had grown to about an 80 or 90 share CSA, and we had three or four full-time employees. Um, and we were trying to do beef and hay and grain, and it was really crazy, and then it stopped raining. And it was the most severe drought on record for our part of Massachusetts. And that really brought us to a breaking point um, and caused us to rethink a lot of the ways that our farm had grown. So uh, we ended up coming to this point and Sophie will talk a little bit about that decision making. Yeah, starting the winter CSA was something that we'd sort of been dreaming about for a couple of years. Um, we'd heard other people talk about it. Uh, and it was sort of this pipe dream we had, and the drought really pushed us to consider um, this change up and kind of allowed us the brain space to be like, we should really consider changing things up. So what we've really loved about changing to the winter model is uh, our workflow is really spread out throughout the year. Um, there's definitely a crunch in the fall, but generally we can focus on growing food all summer harvesting it in the fall uh, sort of is staggered from like mid-August to November into December um, and then we have all winter to market it so that's been a really nice change from being in so many places at once in the summer rushing to get to the farmer's market uh, etc um, we found that you know in the, in the drought we realized that we're going to be paying our employees no matter what um, in a tough year or not. And one of the reasons to move to the winter CSA is that it allowed us to make more of our labor budget our own work um, so that in a good year we get paid and in a bad year we don't have a huge overhead of payroll from having a big crew as we're a pretty small farm. That's a significant, um, that was a significant part of our operating expenses. Um, we do still have a part-time crew, um, but it's very efficient use of labor hours because we have these big days of group projects or bulk harvesting um, our crops. Um, and we also, we haven't really gone into this, but a lot of our fields are sort of small parcels scattered along a mile, um, within a mile of the farm. And there was just a lot of transition time lost in the summer production of, of you know, moving to different fields. Um, and this has just sort of slowed everything down. We are just focused on big blocks of crops. Um, um, and since we're growing fewer crops, we're able to give a lot more attention to what we have in the ground, which we have found leads to better quality in the end. Um, we also are, because we're growing winter storage crops, they have a relatively long shelf life. Um, so, you know, we, when we used to grow a lot of tomatoes, we'd have like three days to move them and it was pretty stressful. Um, this fall we had a bumper carrot crop and we brought in about 10,000 pounds, which was a lot for us. And we were like, I don't know if we can sell all of these, but we have all winter to do it. So we had the time to sort of beef up our marketing side and it looks like we're gonna be sold out by March 1st this year. So it's been nice to have more time to play around with our marketing side of things in the winter. We can play the long game. Yeah. Um, we also are working with pretty heavy clay soil, as Noah mentioned. So um, not having to focus on early summer and spring production has allowed us to push our planting dates back for the most part, um, which is a little bit less stressful in the springtime. And it's also just sort of allowed for more flexibility to have the beef on the farm to use ox power, whereas in the summer there was just too much going on to bring in other enterprises like that. And now Noah's going to go through some of the challenges that we've found in this model. Um, yeah, first of all, it's the, the really obvious one is that a lot of our work is shifted towards the part of the year that's cold. Um, so that means that we're often still harvesting stuff as the ground is freezing. 
Um, and we're washing, for instance, we were washing vegetables all day today. Um, there's a saying that there's no such thing as bad weather. There's only inadequate clothing. And I don't think that's true. I think there is objectively bad weather out there, but a lot of the time, um, it is just about wearing the right clothes. Um, so that's something we've actually spent a lot of time thinking about, whether it's neoprene gloves for harvesting in the late fall or just wearing a lot of wool. Um, we, we do okay. Um, you need a lot more infrastructure. If you have a summer CSA and you have an 8 by 10 walk-in cooler that you fill to the brim every week before CSA distribution and empty it by Friday afternoon, think of that as you, you only have storage for one week's worth of vegetables. We need to have storage for the entire winter's worth of vegetables. So you need more cooler space. Um, winter is no longer truly off, which could either be seen as a pro or a con, depending on how you look at it. Um, cash flow isn't really a con for this because we're still getting most of our income in the form of CSA checks in the fall. Um, although that's different from a regular summer CSA where you're getting your deposits and CSA checks when your biggest financial outlay is to get crops in the spring, crops in the ground in the spring. Um, we've diversified enough that we're selling beef in the summer. We also grow cabbage for a sauerkraut maker. Um, so we sell a bunch of cabbage in the summer. Um, and we've really, we've been able to sort of even things out to the point that it works. Um, because we're growing large blocks of crops that we really only get one chance to grow, um, for instance, our fall carrots or our fall brassicas, um, that puts on a lot of pressure. It's not like when we used to grow a succession of head lettuce every week, if we screwed one up, we would have the next succession coming in at its heels. And now it's kind of the whole year's crop of the whole year's supply of that crop hinges on us getting it right. So we're able to put more effort in, but there's also more pressure. Um, on the marketing end, it's sort of like a war of attrition um, as far as our product list. And by the end of the season, it's hard to generate excitement, especially for our wholesale customers. Um, we do everything we can to keep our CSA share offerings as diverse as possible. So we'll drop things off of the wholesale list long before we run out from our CSA. Um, but that is a that is a challenge. Sophie and Noah, um, can we take a, a question? Can we submit a question? Absolutely. Yes, please. Yes, please. Sure. Okay. So one of our viewers, Dan, is there a reason not to succession plant your winter crops to both spread out harvesting work and take some of that burden of one chance to get it right? We. For instance, with our carrots, um, we spread things out a little bit harvest-wise um, with our fall brassicas, for instance, um, by choosing varieties with different maturity dates. With something like carrots, um, they're ready not so much when they get big, but as once they've been frosted. So. Succession planting wouldn't really spread out the harvest window. Um, we do plant on the early end of the spectrum for fall carrots so that we do have a second shot at it. If we have bad germination, we can till it in and try again. Um, also, um, we really want a good frost for our carrot crops to sweeten up, but um, we used to harvest our beets and carrots at the same time, and we realized over time that the frost doesn't matter as much for beets. So we're planting our beets quite a bit earlier so we can get those out in September so we have enough time in October to do everything else. So we're sort of 
planning our blocks as successions and managing our harvest time that way than within specific crops like you know multiple successions of carrots uh, for the most part. Uh, was there any other questions? Yes, uh, another question that came in that was texted in from a caller in reference to the cattle that you have. Uh, do you rotate your your cattle uh, through your produce um, uh, sites? Um, do you practice that type of rotation? That's a great question. We would love to do more of that. We've done it a little bit. Uh, the problem that we face is most of our vegetable ground is on leased land across the street. Um, it's sort of a major county highway, and it hasn't been feasible to rotate our cattle across the street at this time. We do have a couple of pastures that have, you know, a, a half an acre, an acre or so that are higher up enough that we can grow vegetables um, on those pieces. So we have a couple of half acre parcels that we're able to rotate in and out of pasture and vegetables, which we're really excited oh, no. about on the home farm. Uh, but we can't do a whole rotation that way, unfortunately. Uh, was there another Yes, another question that just came through from Laura and Donna. Uh, Donald, I'm sorry. How do you store your potatoes and winter squash, beets, et cetera, your root vegetables? We'll, we'll get into infrastructure and storage in a little bit. Uh, yeah, we're going okay. to No worries. All right. Thank you so much. And for everyone who's viewing, keep those questions coming. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, awesome. So I'll just dive into the nuts and bolts of our, um, how we've sort of set up our winter share. Um, we have 80 paying shares and 10 barters. Um, we have 15 pickups from the uh, running from the second week in October through the new year and then every other week from there into February. So we're almost done. We've got two more, including tomorrow. Um, and we've, we've always done Wednesday afternoons from 2.30 to 6.30. Seems to work pretty good for people. Um, we charge six fifty for the whole share, um, which comes out to $43 a share, um, which is a little pricey, but um, we feel like it's pretty high uh, value crops that are coming in uh, this time of year. Uh, they've been in the ground a long time. And then one really interesting thing that we do um, is we have a volume-based CSA. That's what we've always done. So you can see in this photo here um, of this share box, it's roughly the dimensions of a brown paper bag on its side. Um, and we tell people they can mound it slightly, but if they're shoving you know, vegetables in, uh, can't fit any more in, then they're taking too much. Um, and it's a pretty different philosophy than a box share, but we really like it. Um, we have happy customers. They can choose what they want. Uh, there's no packing effort on our end. We're not bunching anything. We're not bagging anything. Um, there's a lot less grading. We pretty much put everything out field run. Um, we were sorting carrots and then realized that families were like digging through the bin to find the craziest octopus carrots um, for their kids. So we just started putting everything out field run and um, with the idea that if people don't want it, they don't have to take it. Um, so that sort of allowed us some flexibility on uh, our grading and um, so we just set it up like a farmer's market style and they can take what they want. And people are surprisingly predictable. Like we pretty much have it dialed in exactly how many crates of what we're going to go through a week. And, you know, it'll vary a little bit over time. Um, but it's, it's pretty easy to guess what people are going to take. Um, so it's not just a wild game of trying to figure out how much to wash or pick for each share. Um, it also creates a demonetized culture. So people send their check in or bring it, you know, the first week. Uh, and then we don't have any exchange with them again. Um, and it just feels like they show up, they're getting what they need to eat for the week for their families. Uh, it feels really nice. And we also start to think about it as, you know, some people take more and some people take less. And to us, it doesn't really what we want to see, what we keep an eye on is how much food is going out the door over the whole day. So we know we're moving like a pallet of food or, you know, $3,000 worth of food per share. Um, and if 
we're losing a lot of value. We sort of look at it as a whole, whole, um, you know, it's like we're feeding our community and our community should be taking X value versus sort of nitpicking each shareholder for how much they're taking. Um, and people are really happy with it. We have usually 90 to 95% retention of customers every year. We're just going to start our signups for this year. So we'll know how we're doing, but that, that always feels really good. We don't have to spend a lot of time marketing our share. We have a wait list that we can open it up to if we need to. Um, one important thing about this model of the volume based is that it works really well having other outlets like wholesale. So we're wholesaling every week at the day after our share. So we'll have a big wash, everything will go into the share, and then we have a lot of ex extras to move into wholesale. And it kind of, the wholesale can absorb really high yields of things, or, you know, if we have a a sad yield on something, we just won't offer that in wholesale, but we always try to make sure we have enough for the CSA because that's sort of like the core, the bread and butter of our business. Um, other things about the share, we have a couple, uh, you know, herbs and some flowers and a pick your own, mostly in the early fall, but we want to try to um, um, make that better going forward to get it deeper into winter. Um, we have a really cozy area in the share with a wood stove. I make a big pot of tea. There's a little couch in there, um, lots of kids' toys. Kind of try to have a, a hangout vibe. Oh, yeah, if it wasn't obvious from the other photos, we our pickup is in our greenhouse, um, which is so nice in the winter. Even if it's 30 degrees out, if the sun's out, it's a beautiful place to be. And if it's getting colder in the evening, we'll start up the wood stove. Um, and it generally, it keeps the vegetables from freezing and generally keeps people pretty cozy. Um, and the hangout vibe definitely works. You know, people start bringing cookies to share and it's just a fun spot to hang out in the, the dreary winter time. Um, the other great thing about having our share down in the greenhouse now is we have a lot more space and we started inviting other vendors to come, you know, one or two vendors a week um, who are selling meat and syrup and eggs. And it kind of, without us having to take on those enterprises, we're sort of offering a more full diet CSA to our customers, um, which is really cool. It's been a, a great boon to these other local vendors, even though only you know, 80 families are walking by their booth every Wednesday. Um, it's a really dedicated crowd and they, and they do really well, which is exciting. There, um, it's been really nice over time seeing the same families uh, year after year grow, and it feels really good that there are kids that I remember being babies when their parents joined the summer CSA who are now eight-year-olds running around, um, and that's a lot of the reason why we have a pick-your-own, even though it's too late in the season to have green beans or cherry tomatoes, just having something that parents can get out there with their kids and harvest um, means a lot. And I find that one of the most gratifying parts of this job. Um, I sort of have want to share sort of our philosophy on how to build a CSA share. Um, I sort of see community supported agriculture as kind of an extension of meal planning. Um, and essentially we've curated what our, what goes into our customer's fridge or what they have the option to put in their fridge. Um, so with plenty of variation throughout the season, we always try to cover certain bases. Um, for us, we've found there should always be a green or something that can be readily made into a salad for to be eaten raw, um, a green vegetable for cooking, roots for eating raw or cooking, um, a starch like potatoes, uh, at least one type of allium, so onions, leeks, garlic, shallots, and if possible some fresh herbs. And from those, you can have variations on all of those themes people can start to make meals pretty much exclusively from your produce and offering all of those components to people really makes them excited. Um, but within all of those categories, having novelty is still really important. Um, so sometimes in the early fall, 
we'll have something available, say rutabagas um, or watermelon radish. It's ready to go, but we kind of want to keep another trick up our sleeves for when there's snow on the ground and we can still pull something out of the cooler that our shareholders haven't seen before. Because everyone is so excited about rutabaga. <laughs> well, some, yeah, okay. Um, We've gotten people pretty into kohlrabi. Got to save that as a treat. Uh, also, just having having enough variety that people can use our stuff and not have to go to the supermarket for vegetables, I think is more important to customers than getting the maximum dollar value out of their share. So people could theoretically fill their box with $150 worth of garlic, but nobody does because they also want to have cabbage and butternut squash and potatoes and all of the other good stuff to make their meals out of. Yeah. Um, all right, if we um, interject a question, I had a couple of questions. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, going back to your payment or the way that uh, folks are paying you, do you utilize um, payment plans or options for any low income families? When we've been a few times people have asked us um, if they could work with us and be flexible, and we've always done that. Um, we've never made it an official program. Um, we do offer a work a work trade, um, so people can put in a few hours a week in exchange for their share. Um, but that is that's definitely something that we have have been interested in and haven't yet figured out a good way. We would like to offer a sliding scale um, and we haven't found a model that we're really comfortable with yet, but that's definitely an area that we're, that we could do better in. Yeah, it's always felt a little awkward as a for-profit business, um, how to navigate a sliding scale since most of the models out there are for nonprofit farms, but it's something we're really interested in. At the moment, if anyone comes to us with any issues, we just say pay what you can when you can. Um, and it seems to work well for um, our community. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you provide any cooking demonstrations or recipes for your shareholders? Um, I get asked about the recipes all the time, and I find there's just so many good cookbooks out there, and we have so much that we're providing that I just have decided to never go down that rabbit hole. Um, but we do write a newsletter um, pretty frequently that has a really big following and just sort of describes, um, you know, sort of what's going on in the farm, different aspects of it. Um, and we have thought about cooking demos. Um, we didn't get have the bandwidth to get that going this fall, but we are really interested in sort of skills-based learning, especially for winter share. There's a lot of things that people don't know how to do that would really help them benefit from our share. Um, like basic things like knife sharpening, um, you know, broth, uh, bread baking, things that might go well with other enterprises that we have going on, like our grains or beef. Um, so definitely something that we would love. We have a lot of chef friends that we would love to bring in and do demos. Um, I'm, I'm kind of anti-recipe. Uh, in general, people ask for recipes and I want to teach them instead basic cooking skills because the likelihood that you'll happen to have all of the exact ingredients a recipe calls for, especially if you're trying to cook seasonally, mm -hmm. is small. Um, and so instead, if people know if it's a green, it's probably going to be good sauteed with a little bit of olive oil. People don't need a recipe for every single green. They know how to cook all greens now. Um, and same with most of the root crops, when in doubt, just roast it. And so I'm, I love engaging with our customers about cooking. Um, and I try to get them away from recipes and towards thinking for themselves. Um, are there any other questions, Anna? Not yet, not yet. And I do encourage everyone keep the questions coming. You can call me, you can text me at 413 214 1237 or utilize the chat feature. So we should have some more soon. Great. Great. So to put on a CSA that 
takes place almost a full year after we've placed our seed order, there needs to be kind of a lot of planning. Um, we spend a lot of time in the winter with a whole stack of cardboard pizza boxes on our floor that we've scribbled on with Sharpie with all kinds of notes. That's one, one part of our planning process, um, but our more professional plan is an Excel, Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. Um, it's a pretty standard spreadsheet. Uh, I think originally it came from Brookfield Farm in Amherst. Um, they've done quite a lot of presentations on crop planning, and I totally recommend using their tool if you are thinking of starting a farm or you already run one. Um, one thing that we've changed um, to sort of simplify our crop rotation and sort of codify it is grouping grouping our crops together as much as possible based on not just plant family but also taxonomy uh, but also uh, management um, so for instance um, we have a half an acre of winter squash and a half an acre of potatoes. So those are standalone crop groups in our rotation. But we also have crops that go in the ground really early and come out as late as December. So in that group, we've got celeriac, leeks, parsnips. And even though leeks and parsnips are not botanically related, their management is so similar that we've started rotating them through the fields in the same manner, even though celeriac and parsnips are more closely related to carrots and leeks are more closely related to onions, both of which are in separate crop groups. So it goes a little bit against um, some of the principles of crop rotation, where you never want to plant something in the same family, uh, in the same place more than one year in, more than one year in a row. Um, but it's worked for us, and we've got a wide enough crop rotation that we can still avoid planting the same family in the same place too many times. Um, this year, we are finally figuring out how to standardize our crop rotation. Um, as Sophie mentioned, we have kind of an odd archipelago of strangely shaped fields spread out over about a mile radius. So, and they're all different soil types. So we have a few fields that are sandy and most of them are varying degrees of poorly drained clay. Um, so we've finally been able to come up with groups of fields that we can then rotate our groups of crops through in a standardized way. So a typical rotation would be we plow down or solarize our red clover that followed our grain and we would plant fall brassicas so we would kill the clover in late june and plant our brassicas late june or beginning of july the next year we would put in winter squash and winter squash goes in relatively early and importantly it's done in september um, that leaves us enough time to plant a winter grain like winter rye or wheat and that will start the crop rotation again. Um, this is also borrowed pretty heavily from the Nordells um, and I really recommend for crop planning uh, and rotation planning uh, looking at some of their work. Um, cover crops can be really challenging with late fall harvested crops because there simply isn't enough growing season left after harvest to get a decent cover crop established. Uh, in these pictures here you can see some intercropping that we've done where at our last cultivation we will incorporate um, winter rye or oats depending on whether we want an overwintering cover crop or a spring cover crop. And that has actually served us really well, um, and I recommend doing that whenever you can. You can also see some of our crops are mulched, as you can see with the leeks in the upper left photo. Um, another principle 
that we try to do is to look for ways to increase the profitability of otherwise not so profitable crops that we feel like we have to grow for the CSA. For instance, onions are really labor intensive. And if we were to do an enterprise budget for onions, I would imagine that they wouldn't be very profitable. So we grow enough onions for our CSA and not for wholesale, but then we grow an entire bed of shallots that are the same cultural practices as onions and we grow in the same way, but we can charge $5 a pound for them and chefs purchase them. Um, fingerling potatoes are a similar thing where we have these really valuable fancy potatoes and then we, for chefs, and then we'll grow big high yielding mashing potatoes to sort of feed the people um, in our CSA. Um, and then do we have any questions, Anna, about the planning side of things? Actually, we do. Um, I want to go back. There was a question that came in about how you work with your greens. Are mm -hmm. greens ever included in your CSA share? We always offer them for sale outside the CSA. So we usually have a little table set up outside the main CSA area um, with any extras for sale, which kind of complete the diet. So we'll have our grains that are available, always fresh milled. Uh, we also sell the sauerkraut that's made with our cabbage by a local um, uh, producer of Pigeon Co. ferments. Um, we've thought about doing a grain share. Um, we just seem to sell everything piecemeal just fine. And, uh, you know, it would have to be a sort of declining balance CSA or something because you know, we've got the gluten-free people who just want corn and beans or people who bake a lot and don't want beans. Um, so we've never really put in the effort to figure that out, but it's always something that we wanted to do. I think especially if we diversify the grains more and really make a package. We've also thought about making sort of a deluxe version with a lot of product made from our grains, um, but we just have seemed to sell everything no problem, so we haven't put the extra effort in. But definitely intriguing idea. Okay. And uh, there was a question that came in about the crop rotation plan that you referred to. What was that, uh, what was the name of that plan? Um, the, the one that it was originally based off of um, is from Brookfield Farm in Amherst. And they're uh, one of the older CSAs in the state and their manager made this kind of epic Excel spreadsheet that they've been using for all of their crop planning. Um, for a long time and the farm that I used to work at was started by former apprentices of his and so I started with their crop plan and then I've just changed it a lot since then. You can buy their Excel spreadsheet directly from them for 20 bucks um, if you're starting out figuring out a crop plan it's highly recommended. Yeah. Um, and the the actual rotation of the grain with the sort of extensive blocks of vegetables is uh, we've taken a lot from Ann and Eric Nordell in Trout Run, Pennsylvania. They're a draft power farm that uh, really thought a lot of these things in a really elegant way. They have a, a publication called Weed the Soil, Not the Crop. Um, they've been able to, through crop rotation, uh, get the seed bank of weeds in their soil so low that they no longer have to hand weed anything on their farm. Um, we're but not they, quite there yet. Yeah, but. we're definitely not there. <laughs> we take their cultivation um, practices really in a, in a similarly serious way. Yeah. Okay. And that yeah. brings us to this next question on weed management. Um, our one of our viewers, Dan, wanted you to speak briefly or discuss briefly your weed management strategy. Um, we. Try not to basically the number one thing is we try not to let any weeds go to seed, and to achieve that, we are really on it with cultivation. Um, and we started using all grass power for our cultivation. If you saw the earlier photos of that straddle cultivator, um, it's extremely adjustable when we're able to change the toolbar to fit any crop at any food, and we've done a really effective job of uh, hitting those weeds at the seed stage. 
Um, and then we, we do some hand weeding, we do some hoeing. Uh, what, you know, we've been known to walk through our cover crops, getting uh, weed seed heads out of the field. Um, it's just something we've really prioritized. We were lucky enough to inherit fields that had been in hay for about 30 years. And so the number of seeds for annual weeds was really low. Um, our biggest weed challenges are bindweed and Canada thistle, which are both really deep rooted perennial weeds that were there in the pasture or in the hay field when we first turned it under. So those continue to be a huge struggle and they are a lot of the reason why we till as much as we do. Um, we're trying to always find ways to reduce tillage and get closer to no-till and we haven't been able to as much as we'd like to because everything would be covered in bindweed. You can see in this, this looks like a pretty clean field of cabbage we're cultivating, but you can see sort of up on this hillock that's just carpets of bindweed. Uh, so it's definitely something we struggle with. So we have very little lamb's quarter and pigweed, but we that doesn't mean that we have no weed problems at all. And uh, the final question for this round is concerning, it's around uh, the topic of cover crops. You mentioned with the late rotation, um, trying to get a cover crop in could be a little problematic. When are you actually planting your cover crops? The crops that are coming out early enough uh, are usually in the rotation where we can go right into a winter grain. So winter squash and potatoes are good examples. We're going to clean that whole field out, harvest it. Um, we also have a no-till drill that if the field's clean enough, we can go right over that field with our uh, winter grain crop. Um, for the uh, other crops like late that are really late harvested, like carrots and fall brassicas, we're sowing usually rye, but sometimes some other mixes um, at the last cultivation. So that's usually, usually at the end of August. We, we have to be a little bit careful with some crops like lettuce or chicories that they are big enough to stay ahead of the cover crop. If you plant a cover crop in, say, a field of three or four inch wide lettuce heads, the cover crop often can get ahead of it and smother the cash crop. So that's something to watch out for. The timing is a little bit tricky sometimes. I don't know. How tight are we on time? We we have some more to go. Should we keep going, Anna? Yes, you can. We, um, we're at 7.48, so you still have some time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. So as I mentioned before, uh, there's some infrastructure needs that are unique to a storage crop CSA. Um, these two truck bodies are were our main investment. Um, when we made this switch. They're relatively inexpensive. Um, they're also really variable in quality. Um, the one on the right was a milk truck that is pretty ancient. It's made out of fiberglass and steel and it weighs a lot and it works really well. It's very well insulated. The one on the left, uh, the Mama Rosie's ravioli truck, um, is just stick built with blown in foam and we have a really hard time keeping that warm or cold depending on the weather outside. Um, so uh, buyer beware, but this is a really inexpensive way to get into this game. Um, we have a 10 by 20 foot standard walk-in um, in our former pack shed. Um, all of the refrigeration is air conditioners with cool bots. Um, I'm assuming everyone is familiar with the cool bot, but I'll answer any questions about them um, as they come up. Um, different crops have different needs. So it's nice actually to have several different spaces to store vegetables in. Um, if any of you, uh, have the opportunity to go to any of Chuck Curry's talks at the summer or winter conference. He talks a lot about storage conditions and is, has been a real resource for us. Um, humidity is a huge factor. Um, 
as anyone who's had carrots turn into rubber in their refrigerator can attest. So we have one cooler that is cold and wet. We actually keep the humidity high by using a uh, misting setup for um, reptile cages where it's on a timer and then it just sprays water into the air in a really fine mist every hour or two. And so we try to keep the humidity around 95% in there. And we try to keep that as close to freezing without going under as possible. Um, and so that would be celeriac, carrots, beets, um, parsnips, parsnips uh, storage radishes. Most of the root crops um, will dehydrate really easily. So cold temperatures, high humidity is really important. Um, we have a dry cool cooler, which we use for onions, garlic, and potatoes. All of those are a little more resistant to drying out. And in the case of the alliums, it's really important to keep them dry or else they'll begin to sprout. Um, and with potatoes, we're sort of fudging it a little bit because the potatoes should be around 40, but instead we're keeping them more around 35 to keep the onions happy. So we make some compromises, but it's been working out pretty well for us. Um, winter squash really likes it warm and below 55 or 50, you start to have storage injury. So don't refrigerate winter squash, whatever you do. I actually, Sophie and I cleaned out a corner of my parents' basement and that's where our squash live once it starts to get cold in October. Um, we actually still have a fair amount of butternut down there now and it's holding pretty well. Um, Post-harvest handling is really important for vegetables like squash. We actually dip each individual squash in sanidate as it's coming out of the field and a mixture of castor oil and dish soap to make it uh, less palatable to rodents. Um, because we've had some issues with that in my parents' basement and in the barn. Um, it's also important to mention that walk-in coolers need to be rodent proof, not so much because of mice and rats, but the meadow vole um, will do a significant amount of damage and just be really unsanitary uh, if they get into your cooler. Um, let's see, here's a picture of uh, our onions curing. Um, one thing I should mention about storing garlic and onions is that airflow is also important in addition to humidity. We store garlic in the long term on bread trays, uh, so these blue shallow plastic trays, and we try to never go more than two layers deep. Um, when we do, we almost always have premature sprouting. Um, I have a, Here's more I do have of one a, quick question for the viewer about uh, freezing. How do you keep um, the storage areas from freezing? That's a great question. Uh, it depends on how vulnerable the space is, but we use everything from an incandescent light bulb to space heaters. Um, we have a couple of different kinds of space heaters. We keep an eye on the weather. Um, this is something you can really set up to automatically monitor. Uh, we sort of have a the lowest version of that possible, and we'd like to get more high tech. Uh, but basically, one of our friends set up uh, a monitoring system in the coolers that texts NOAA <coughs> the um, the temperature uh, at 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. every day, and then if it goes outside a certain parameter, we'll get a warning text. And that's really been a nice peace of mind. I yeah. Do you have any more to say about the setup? I just I I should have mentioned it earlier and I can't recommend it highly enough. Um, the peace of mind when it's zero degrees out to get a text from your walk-in cooler saying it's still 35 degrees in there. Um, it's really nice, especially if you don't live on the farm. Um, most of the storage vegetables are safe down to about 28 degrees because of the amount of sugars in them. Um, so there's a little bit more wiggle room, but we 
try to not let the coolers go below 32. Um, so we cure garlic and onions in the barn on tables, pretty standard, standard oh, procedure. Go back for a minute. So the, we find the roots in this photo um, in the poly sack. We harvest them straight into those sacks dirty in the field, and then we'll store those sacks in those big super sacks, like old Vermont compost bags. And that double layer of poly weed seems to really keep the humidity in for the wet loving crops. Um, and the jury is sort of out on if you should wash before storage or not, um, according to all the people we've talked to, but we just find that we don't have the time in the fall to wash, so we just run a big wash every couple weeks, and so everything's being stored dirty for the most part, um, and we'll go into that one more. Jim, oh, and we also cure our winter squash um, in the greenhouse, which we found to be uh, really effective at their storage and quality. Okay, the root washer. So the, having a way to wash roots mechanically is such a labor saver. I don't think it would be possible for us to do what we do without it. Um, we've, we're continually trying to improve our wash line um, and we've come a pretty long distance. This is our first root washer maybe five, six years ago and it is a pedal powered there's a, a stationary bicycle on the far side of the washer there and this is me washing parsnips in a snowstorm um, which was about as fun as it looks um, it worked some of the time most of the time and the parsnips came out cleaner than they were before we washed them and that's about all that can be said for this process. Um, finally, we bought a grindstone farm root washer. Um, and that felt like the best thing that we had ever had on the farm. Um, we could wash many, many times more in a significant amount of time. And uh, nobody had to sit there on a stationary bike pedaling away. Um, there's an electric motor up top with a gearing transmission, and it's driven by a chain. So this whole cylinder wash, uh, rotates, and there's a pipe down the middle that is attached to a hose, and there's holes drilled in it, and it sprays water on the crops. Um, downsides of this setup were that someone had to stand there holding a piece of wood in front of the door to keep vegetables from coming out when you didn't want them to. Um, also, the drainage system, there's a water catchment underneath so that we wouldn't get a flood or buildup of mud in our greenhouse. Um, and that was always sort well, of... I should fancy. also note that um, one huge improvement was moving this into our greenhouse. Yes. Um, <laughs> so we can wash on cold days pretty comfortably. And this is our current setup. Um, we realized we needed a way to change the flow of vegetables going through the root washer. Um, I built the frame towards the front of the root washer um, and welded on a winch from an old boat trailer that we then attached to the bows of the greenhouse. Um, I reinforced the bows so that the weight of the washer wouldn't pull our greenhouse down, which hasn't happened yet. So, so far, so good. Um, but we can, using the winch, tip the washer up to get roots to fall out or tip it down so that roots stay in it. Our clay soil tends to be more clingy than many people's soil, so it often takes us a lot longer to get roots clean. Um, our drainage system, um, any water, all the water and mud coming off of the roots comes down this piece of corrugated greenhouse plastic and into this water trough where a sump pump um, brings the wastewater outside onto a grassy area that um, benefits from all of the soil and organic matter being deposited on it. 
And then we've got a pack table on the other end of it. Um, and we've set up this board uh, that has screws in it that we can put uh, perforated bags for 25 pounders uh, that hold 25 pounder roots. And we can sort one of them is for seconds, one of them is for firsts. This has made it a lot more efficient for us to pack for wholesale. We now have an inventory on hand. Um, so in addition to the root washer, um, we talked about how we store stuff. Um, I should have mentioned potatoes. We store in um, wood and wire pickle crates that are originally used for cucumbers. Um, and those are collapsible, so we can break them down at the end of the season, and then we just harvest directly into them and cure the potatoes first and then put them into storage. Um, this year, we stored cabbages in a super sack, and the humidity was too high, and we had a lot of spoilage. Um, in the past, we've built a wooden corral, with the cabbage corral, as it's called around here, and that had a lot more airflow. It was sort of similar to like a squash bin with slatted sides. And so we'll be moving back towards that method next year. Um, so there's a lot of trial and error and sort of watching your vegetables um, helps prevent surprises later on in the storage season. Oh, another thing we should just mention while we're going back to um, vegetable storage is one cool thing we've discovered is um, we can harvest chicories like radicchio and pandazu grow pretty late, uh, like late November, early December, uh, and the high quality ones we wrap in newspaper and store in totes, and we still have them now, and they're beautiful. Um, it's been a really cool discovery. So, you know, any ones that look maybe a little frost damaged or a little sad will move out right away, and um, the deep storage ones we can keep now, and it's it's awesome to have. Can we field one question at this point? Absolutely. Uh, there was a question uh, concerning how you're bagging your vegetables. Um, when they come out of the root washer wet, do you bag them and store them wet? Yes. Um, these bags that we use are perforated, so there's some airflow. Um, and we're primarily putting crops that we're, we're really actually only washing crops that like it very humid. Um, potatoes do fine with the high humidity, but they don't need it. Um, so yeah, uh, the bags are designed to maintain high humidity, but there's still enough airflow that it doesn't get slimy. We're also only wash, we wash pretty much every two weeks. Um, so we'll do enough for wholesale for two weeks worth. Um, so they're not sitting in the bag for a really long time. Um, some farms will wash their whole crop as it comes out of the field and store them in these 25 pound perforated bags, which I think could work. It's just always made us nervous that if you have one carrot go slimy in the middle of the bag that you can't see, are you gonna pull it out in January and try to sell it um, and not really verify that your crop is still high quality? Um, so the amount of time that it's in the bags for us does not seem to be an issue at all. I would worry about the whole season and airflow. Was there any other questions? Uh, no, not, not at this point. Um, okay. Towards Great. the end, I think we're going to have a few more questions as you begin to wrap up. Mm -hmm. So just briefly, um, yeah. looking forward, um, always trying to tweak our systems more. Uh, we have been able to have greens in the share straight out of the field, and then we do have one small hoop house, um, like a 30 by 40 high tunnel um, that we've been able to get some greens from. We're also experimenting with growing pea shoots under grow lights, um, but generally people want greens this time of year. They're really special. Um, so I think we're gonna put in another greenhouse this year to ensure that we have enough. Um, other improvements we're trying to make were, you know, as we grow older, we're constantly thinking about how much we're lifting. Um, and we would love to move more in the moving vegetables by the pallet mode. Um, in our 
in our walk-in cooler that's in our old pack shed, uh, we have a new palace size door that we're going to be installing. We're thinking when we wash, we might be able to pack a whole pallet uh, of a full, all the needs for to, to throw a CSA share on that pallet, and then we can just wheel the pallet out. Um, it's a little tricky that our storage and our greenhouse where our share takes place aren't all on the same level that we can just, you know, use a pallet jack. But it's definitely the direction that we want to move long term. Um, we're always trying to find the balance between keeping our business small and making it so that we're still the ones out there in the field doing the farm work and not sitting in an office. But we also are realizing that we need a more steady supply of hired labor um, on the farm, uh, in part because if Sophie or I got injured at any point, um, we'd be down 50% of our crew. And so if we had more people on board, that gives us a little bit of security, but there's lots of trade-offs that way as well. So that's something that we're always thinking about, and I'm sure we'll continue to find, continue to search for that balance in the coming years. Um, and then just sort of a, there's always the philosophical question of, are we trying to maximize the amount of food grown for our community, um, maximize how exciting and cool our farm is, or maximize our quality of life? And we're trying to navigate some of the contradictions um, of those. So those are those are really our priorities going forward, um, and those are the the areas that we're needing to change things. Um, so I'd love to open it up to questions, um, uh, um, both now and if anyone wants to email us, our email addresses are on the um, final slide right here. Okay. And our, our last couple of questions are concerning um, the infrastructure that you have in reference to high tunnels. A uh, viewer had a question about how many high tunnels do you have of each size? And the follow-up question to that, how many are used for crop production versus infrastructure, the root washer, the CSA uh, pickup, and so forth? So so our our seedlings are started in the same greenhouse as we do our wash station and CSA distribution, which is a 22 by 44 high tunnel. Um, so nothing's grown in the ground in that greenhouse. Right. We have landscape fabric down covering the ground. And then we've got a 30 by 50 high tunnel that we put in in 2010 that we grow in, in ground, um, primarily greens in the winter. And then we have currently two hoop houses that are 12 by 65 each um, that we would really like to tear down. Um, I did a lousy job building them, and it's we've gotten pretty frustrated trying to grow stuff in them. Um, we've had a lot of flooding issues. The drainage wasn't right. Um, so we're looking forward to improving that side of things. We are also interested in. Um extending green production in the field as much as possible. Uh, so, you know, covering with um, really good reme, um, like thick, extra thick reme. Um, we want to experiment more with conduit hoops, um, trying to get kale and spinach and arugula in the field as long as possible, and some really cold hardy lettuces. Um, I think we could do a better job going forward. Um, Taipar? as opposed to Agrabon or any of the other row covers out there um, has been really good. Um, the fibers in it are much longer and stronger than um, in a traditional row cover. And we're in a really windy spot. We're right on the coast. And so the wind whips off of the ocean and we can regularly get 50 or 60 mile an hour wind. So Taipar has been the way to go for keeping things covered. It was an investment, but it doesn't shred like Rime, and I think it's going to last a really long time. This was our first fall with it, and I'm in love with it. 
Are there other questions, Anna? Uh, at this point, I don't see any additional questions. Uh, I do see your email if folks have questions, and you know how it always goes. You have questions after the end of the live webinar. <laughs> Feel sure. free to um, sure. contact Noah and Sophie. Their emails are up. That's noah.kellerman at gmail.com and sophie.corser at gmail.com. And if you'd like a copy, they can request that from you of your presentation, correct? Yep. Okay. Okay. And this uh, recording will be up on the YouTube page in a couple of days. I could send a link out if you wish to get a copy for yourself to study and to look at. This was a very informative webinar. You all did such a wonderful job, and I learned a tremendous amount. Hopefully, uh, you will be presenting at the summer conference um, that's coming up August uh, 10th and 11th at Hampshire College. And I think that's Noah's alma mater, correct? That's correct. All right, so I look forward to seeing you there and seeing everyone there. If you would like more information about the summer conference, feel free to reach out. You can contact me at Anna at nofamass.org uh, to get more information about our registration about the summer conference, as well as information about becoming a member. I can't stress that enough. Um, Noah and Sophie are members, and Noah is actually a NOFA board member. And I really want to thank them both for their time with us tonight. This was such a wonderful, wonderful webinar, and hopefully uh, people will go back and study this. So I look forward to everyone tuning in next month. Uh, the last Tuesday of February will be joined by Bill Braun. Uh, he's actually hosting a Seed Sovereignty Day that's coming up on February 9th. I encourage everyone to go to our website to get more information on a very timely event around seeds and the, the taking care of our seeds. And he will be recapping some of that in his webinar at the end of February. So again, a big thank you to Noah and Sophie for being with us tonight. <clears throat> and I look forward to hearing and seeing everyone next month. Everyone have a great night. Thank you so much. Thank Stay you. warm. Good night, thank everyone. You.